lot of new faces, so in case you don't know who I am, my name is Kelly McCoy. I am the college and young adult pastor. You don't have to be in college. Uh, you just have to be under 26 uh, to be here. So, so glad you're here. And if not, you, you know, we can talk and maybe we can get you serving somewhere. And... Um, and two things that we say every single week is that Soma is a place where you can belong before you believe. You don't have to believe the things that we believe in order to be with us, right? We can still be friends. It's all good. But our hope is that you walk out of those doors with more Jesus than you came with. No matter where you are in your faith journey, whether you have a whole lot of Jesus or whether you don't barely know who Jesus is, by the end of t tonight, you will walk out of here knowing more about Jesus and hopefully experiencing more of his presence in your life. All right? So let's just jump into this. I think it's important for us to know what's important to the people we love. I just do. You know, I think a relationship just can't happen unless you know what's important to the other person. Uh, and uh, have you ever been in a situation where, like, you really just, oh, man, I really like this guy or I really like this girl. And so you find out what's important to them and then suddenly... Everything that they like is important to you, too. Well, I have a good friend. His name is Jack Black. We have a video of his encounter actually finding out what's important to the one that he loves, Encarnacion. Please, turn your attention to the screen. impersonate that whole like scene by myself and I just like called up Burnaby or called up uh, Brandon and I was just like you know what I don't think I can do it as well as Jack Black did so I'm sure most of you guys are grateful Jack Black did it instead of me everything you just said is exactly what I like to do every day it's my jam but in order for a relationship to deepen or even to happen you need to know what's important to that other person Right? And a lot of us in here, a lot of us showed up to church today. Thank you for showing up. You guys want a relationship with Jesus, or maybe you just showed up. Maybe you want a relationship with the girl across the way, and that's cool too, right? <laughs> but in order for uh, that relationship to grow, it's really important to find out what's important. And, um, and I've had experiences like that, and um, shallow ones or deep ones. And eventually, the more you fall in love with someone, the things that are important to them just suddenly become important to you. And it's not fake. You know, it's not like it doesn't happen overnight. It's a relationship which develops. And so tonight, what I want to talk about is finding out what's important to Jesus. Because at the end of the day, that really will dictate our priorities. Because some of you guys think that what you find important is what God finds important. And maybe tonight is the night where you find out maybe that's not true. And tonight, I actually found a passage that points to the most important passion Jesus has in his life, death, and resurrection. And we get to read that tonight. And we, hopefully, we get to be changed by it tonight. If we, go ahead and open your Bibles to Luke 15. As we read God's word and find out what's important. It's Luke 15, 1. And before we do, I'm just going to go ahead and pray as you guys flip through. It's okay. You can keep turning on your Bibles. Father, magnify your word. We know that your word does not return void. Meaning, if someone reads it, it has the ability to change my life without commentary. Because your words are that powerful. Your words have the ability to create life into existence. Your words breathe life. Your word has the ability to penetrate the deepest parts of my needs and satisfy every single desire that I've ever had. And I pray that you would satisfy the desires of the thirsty soul that is in this room tonight. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Luke 15, 1 says, <clears throat> Now the tax collectors and sinners were gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered. Muttered just simply means whispering. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told this parable. Parable is a story with a surprise. You don't always like the surprise, but there's a surprise. Suppose one of you have a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after that lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, lamb chops for dinner. No, he says, <laughs> I just want to see if you guys are paying attention. Read your Bibles if you're not laughing. Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you, in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who do not need repentance. And if you don't understand sheep, he has another one with a coin. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. And in the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. I desperately want what's important to Jesus important to me. I desperately want that. And in order to have a love relationship with Jesus that is intimate and close, I need to know what breaks his heart. And my prayer for us today is that what breaks his heart hopefully will break yours and cause us to move and have a vision for our lives. So the first thing that we need to see in this passage, it says, now the tax collectors and sinners were gathering around Jesus to hear Jesus. Tax collectors and sinners are gathering around Jesus. But the Pharisees and tax collectors, well, they were muttering. Who uses that word anyways, muttering? Anyways. So what we see here are two different types of people. You see tax collectors and sinners. And you see Pharisees and scribes. So tax collectors and sinners, let me just explain to you. A tax collector is a person that is hired by the Roman government, government to collect money from Jewish people. All right, see, you understand at this time, first century, Ju you know, Judaism is pretty much oppressed by the Roman government. It would be as if you're living in, I don't know, North Korea or something. You're being oppressed by North Korea, right? It, it, that's the idea is that the Roman government is oppressing the Jewish people and they send other people to collect money from Jewish people so that they can, you know, feed their bellies. But they're not just any people. The Roman government hired Jewish people to collect money from Jewish people. And so Jewish people did not like those tax collectors. In fact, they would call them what? Traitors. Traitors. So essentially, these traitors and sinners are hanging out with Jesus. Now, sinners, most people can do a pretty good job of hiding their sin. They don't walk around, walk around with a sign that says sinner or a big S on their chest that says sinner. Most people are good at hiding those things, but the reality is, is that these people's sins were so bad and so public that everybody knew that they were sinners. They would be like ex-criminals. -criminal, these are the people that are on Megan's Law. Right? These are the people that you wouldn't want to hang out with. So you have these people, they clearly know that they clearly know by society's rules that they are far from God. They know they're far from God. But yet, they can't help but draw near to the truth of Jesus Christ. And then you have a second group of people called the Pharisees. And these were religious hypocrites. That's because they weren't fair. You see? 
All right, so Pharisees. So you got these Pharisees and scribes who thought they were close to God. They thought they were close to God, right? Because they, you know, they went to VBS when they were little. You know, they were dragged to church every day. They never missed a day. They stopped at every red light. They stopped at every stop sign. They used their blinker all the time. Like, these guys live by the books. They had rules on top of rules to keep them from breaking the rules. These guys felt and knew that they, they thought they were close to God. They thought they were close to God. So you have these two groups of people. You have a group of people that think they're close to God, and you have a second group of people that feel very far from God. And let me tell you, those two, those two groups of people are here right now. They're sitting to the right and left of you. Two groups of people represented here. The first group thinks they're close to God. The second group feels very far from God, and they're represented here. And the Pharisees didn't have a problem with Jesus' teaching. What were they muttering about? It says, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Whoa, he welcomes them. And the Greek word for this welcome word here, you can circle that, is the word, it simply means that if you welcome these people, that means you accept them. You accept these people. And this is something that Jesus did because Pharisees and, tax, or Pharisees and scribes would not hang out with these traitors and sinners, right? They would be considered unclean because to eat with these people would mean to accept them. But let me tell you the difference between acceptance and approval. And I think the church needs to understand the difference. See, approval means what's good for you is good for me. And that's not necessarily always the case. Right? What I do, what everything I do, you may not approve of. And everything that you do, I may not approve of. I probably don't. But that doesn't mean we can't be friends. That doesn't mean I accept you. That doesn't mean I'll fight for your rights. That doesn't mean I love you. Acceptance and approval are different. But the thing is that Jesus, these religious people were, were, were mad at Jesus for accepting people who were far from God. But Jesus did not, you know, water down the truth. He spoke the truth in love, and he loved them so much that they drew near to him. Jesus understands that there's two types of people in your life. There's two types of people in this room. And he cares about them both. And Jesus shares what he's willing to do for the one lost person who either thinks they're close to God or feels very far from God. So in the presence of these Pharisees, he starts to tell a story. A very convicting story at that. In the earshot of his followers who feel far from God, he looks at the Pharisees and he says, I got a story to tell you and you'll be surprised by it. And he says, suppose one of you have a sheep, have 99 sheep. It says in verse 3, Then Jesus told the parable, Suppose one of you has a 100 sheep and loses one of them. Pause. Ooh. This is almost borderline insulting to a Pharisee. You know why? It's like, it's like telling like a brain surgeon, like Dr. Shepard from Grey's Anatomy, that imagine you're a pharmacy clerk at Rite Aid. Right, that's what that's the equivalent of this because shepherds were like the lowest rung of you guys don't watch Grey's Anatomy, that's good. Um, <laughs> but it's like telling a brain surgeon like you work at Rite Aid. All right, so it's like shepherds back then are the lowest, you know, grade of you know occupation. In fact, the people who own the sheep is probably not the shepherd. They hired a guy to take care of the sheep, which makes the situation very hairy. Or, or curly, or, or whatever, soft and fluffy. I don't know. This is sheep. Oh. Suppose one of you have 100 sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after? Somebody say, go after. 
the lost sheep until he finds it. Now, the word for go after literally means to like leave your life behind. Like the, the situation that Jesus is painting is completely drastic. It's completely dreadful because the last thing you want to do is not just lose your sheep, but lose somebody else's sheep because this is a shame-based culture. Because it's a shame and honor-based culture, the last thing you want to do is show up with only 99 sheep. That's the worst thing you can do. And the, so when Jesus says, hey, what if you lost the sheep? People are shuddering. No. <laughs> Not the sheep. Because they know that this, this potentially can ruin the reputation of this guy's family. Like, this is the lowest job anybody. You're never going to get hired again. You're the sheep loser. Like, you can never get hired again. You're the guy who lost the sheep. So, yes, will you not leave your life to go after the sheep? Yup, they all replied. And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders. Pause. Okay, have you ever been lost in a grocery store and your parents try to find you? Okay, me and Royal. Okay, uh, maybe I said that too fast. Have you ever been lost in a grocery store and your parents had to try to find you? Okay, great. Yeah, I did say that too fast. Thank you guys for being patient. <laughs> so I remember getting lost in aisle seven, right, because I got like, like I'm just like shopping with my mom. I'm bored as heck um, because we're in church. I'm doing Christian cussing. Um, so I'm bored as heck, and I'm on aisles, what is that, what did I say, seven? Seven, perfect number. Um, and then I'm like looking at the squirt guns, and before I know it, I turn around, guess who's not there? Mom. And then I'm like, uh-oh, maybe I should go try another aisle. So I go to aisle six, which is the opposite direction where mom went. And then I hear uh, in the intercom, you know, uh, Kelly, your mom is looking for you. And then I'm running, I'm running, I'm looking for my mom, I can't find her. And then my mom finds me. Can I just tell you, she did not joyfully <laughs> pick me up and take me home. All right, let me just tell you. There's something very endearing about this passage that I think my mom can learn from. <laughs> so you get what I'm saying. Um, so, and when he finds it, verse 5, verse 5, everyone, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders. And where doesn't he go? Why doesn't he go back to the 99 to put that sheep back to work? No, instead he puts it on his shoulders, and he goes home. He goes home with the one lost sheep. And then he calls his friends and neighbors to say, first of all, the last thing I would want to do is out myself by calling my friends and neighbors. However, this guy is really excited. Rejoice with me. I found my lost sheep. I tell you that there, that, so he stops talking to, to the people, and he starts looking at the Pharisees, and he says, I tell you, this isn't about sheep. That in the same way, this guy, as radical as he was willing to depart from his life and lovingly go after a sheep, in the same way, there is more rejoicing in heaven over one person who feels far from God. One person. One sinner. And all the sinners in the room resonated with that. There's more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who do not need repentance. And the sinners went wild. And the, <laughs> the, shepherd, the shepherd's motivation, granted it was honor and shame, but the shepherd took unbelievable measures to restore what was lost. The shepherd took unbelievable measures to, to restore what was lost. Jesus reminds us of the sacrifice that he's willing to give for the one lost life. And I know that you guys all have one lost life that you care about. And I'm not talking about their loss like, you know, they're somewhere on Devonshire and Reseda. But you know what I mean. 
They're lost in relationships. They're lost in addiction. They're lost in insecurity. They're lost in pride. They're lost in education. They're lost in people pleasing. But they're very far from being home with Jesus. There's one life you know that is far. And Jesus reminds us, he's reminding these two groups of people, this is the most important thing to me. I'm willing to sacrifice my reputation by accepting people who don't fit the religious mold of society. So much, I'm willing to sacrifice my life for one. Jesus also shares with us the value of this one lost life. He shares with us the value of the one lost life. At first, he shared with us the sacrifice of the one lost life. Now, he's sharing with us the sacrifice of the one lost life. See, there's a women and men in this audience. And there's women and men in that audience in the first century, which it makes it really amazing. We, we can talk about that for a minute, but I won't. <laughs> but the first story resonates with men. The second story resonates with women. And Jesus is giving a story, telling people, Put yourself in this person's shoes. Okay, I can put myself in the shoes of a dude. But he's saying, put yourself in the shoes of this woman. And all the women in the audience like, start to lean in, like, what is he going to say? This one's for me. And all the women start to resonate with what he says here. He says, or suppose a woman. A woman has 10 silver coins. Pause. 10 silver coins. You're like, big whoopee doo. I got 20 of them in my pocket. Um, No, just kidding. You guys use credit cards. Um, (laughs) 10 silver coins. Traditionally, these silver coins represent a dowry, right? This is what you give to your spouse in order to start your family, right? This is literally your inheritance. Your bank account is on your head and is represented in 10 silver coins. So it would be very shameful for a single woman to walk around with only nine. Be like, you see that girl with the nine coins? Oh my gosh, (laughs) cannot believe her. You see that girl? Like she'd be hated on so hard. So she doesn't even want to go outside she doesn't even want to go outside. So what does she do? What does she do? She's lost. She, she, she's lost. She's lost her coin. All right. So doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully? The word search carefully in the Greek is called zeteo. It means to look at, look for with the uncertainty of ever finding it. That's the worst situation to be in. It's like, it's like when your mom or your dad, like you, like you wake up in the morning, you're like, oh, I can't find my sock, I can't find my shirt, whatever, and you know your mom and dad do laundry, and, uh, and so you look through your drawers once, and, um, and then eventually you're like, oh, man, I'm so tired of looking for things. So you yell downstairs, mom, dad. And they're like, what? Like, where's my socks? Where's my shoes? Or where's my, you know, where's my hoedown shirt? Uh, <laughs> where's my hoedown shirt? Um, and, and they're like, did you look for it? Yeah, look for it again. And you're like, oh, man. And so, <laughs> because, because all you wanted to do is have them find it for you so that you could do something else, right? Because I know that trick. I do it with my wife all the time. Sorry, hon. <laughs> so what do you need to do? You turn on the light. Duh. Uh, <laughs> Right? And then you empty things out because you really want to find your hoedown shirt because it's September 10th and you got to go to the hoedown and it's like 6 o'clock and you got to get there before all the food is gone. So you're like, I cannot find my shirt. And so you're, you're, just, you're just pulling everything out and you, and you just, you got to find it. How about I give you a more severe example? Um, I went to Tanzania not too long ago and my wife couldn't find her passport. And that's how the story starts. Um, and we're in front of LAX. So, oh, we were in Tanzania. That's even worse because in Tanzania, you get caught without uh, a passport and you don't know what's going to happen to you. You just, no, you just don't know. I don't know. I don't know. 
They might not send me. I just don't know. And so we're in Tanzania, and, like, we get to the bus, and we're like, where's our passport? I'm like, I don't know. I got mine, but where's yours? And so, like, so, so, like, we literally did not know where it was. We, we opened every drawer. We went through every piece of clothing. And then, sure enough, we were going through luggage. And we were, like, just moments between going, like, going into other people's luggage to look for this passport. And then finally, it was like stuck in between a book, in between something, in between. Like we took everything out of the bag and we found it inside like one of her journals. Moral of the story, don't use your passport as a bookmark. All right? Fair enough. (laughs) Zateo, search carefully. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house? Now sweep the house, I really want to talk about that. She's wi- literally willing, like, like, to clean out the parts of her life or, you know, her home that have been unkept. And the truth of the matter is there's parts of your life that are unkept, and you think, it's, you, think you want to do it for yourself, but really other people are affected by it. There are lost coins around you all the time. But it's your dysfunction, your sin in your life that have been unkept and you have not dealt with. That will change the course of someone's destiny. She lights a lamp. You know that we are a city on the hill. A light to the world. You understand that. That's a different sermon, but I'll I'll go there sometime with you. And when she finds it, she dodged that bullet. She didn't leave her house. You realize these people, they, they live in clay houses. They live in houses with very small pieces of light, very, very small windows because it's so hot, you don't want a lot of light in. So these are small houses, very dark. And she went through a lot of work and a lot of searching to find this. And she did not want to leave her house because of the impending embarrassment that she would incur. And then she finds it and she celebrates She didn't stop until she found it. And Jesus is telling the story, and you know what the surprise is? The surprise is that Jesus didn't stop until he found you. It's true. He did not stop until he found you. And he's not stopping until he finds the one that you love too. The question is, is that will you join? Will you join this woman in searching carefully Rearranging your life to make room for the one that you love. Who is it? Who is it? Who is it that you don't want to imagine heaven without? Who is it that you don't want to imagine eternity without? Will you search after the one? Lost life. Until you find it. Don't give up after one try. You're like, oh, well, I tried. You know, I gave him a flyer, whatever. Like, oh, you know, I wore a shirt. I posted on Instagram. Right? Don't stop. Search after. It's worth losing your reputation over. Jesus is worth your reputation. He's worth the extra effort. He's, these people who are dying are worth your life because you have eternity. You don't have anything else to lose. You got everything to gain. But the people around you are lost, and you know it. You know there are people that are lost in their situations. And last, Jesus shares the joy. Jesus shares the joy for the one lost life. Now, this is awesome because I love to party. And I love a Jesus who loves to celebrate. And the interesting thing about this passage is is we don't see the angels in heaven rejoicing over anything else in the Bible other than this, which is interesting. Let's go ahead and read it. Verse 10. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of angels over one sinner who repents. Over one sinner who repents. Guess what? We get to celebrate with that. We get to celebrate with the angels. We do. Because the angels in heaven, you know what? They're not like, I don't know what, you've, what Christmas story you've ever seen. But no angels are getting wings when babies laugh. 
Angels don't rejoice when you read your Bible. They don't rejoice when you show up to Soma, which, you know, whatever. <laughs> Angels don't rejoice for any other reason than over one sinner who repents. What's important to God needs to be important to us. But if that's going to happen, what breaks God's heart needs to break ours. And the, and the thought of the one in our life who we love, the thought of spending eternity without them should break your heart. and should cause you to action. It should cause you to, cause you to search for them, seek out for them, depart from your life and find them and bring them home. That's why Soma is a family, not a club, because this is a home where you're going to walk out of here with more Jesus than you came with. So the question remains, who is the one life that you can't imagine eternity without? Who is that? Don't tell me out loud. Just write it down. Who is the one life? It could be the person in your biology class. Whoever God puts in your mind even right now, there could be just one person in your life, just one life who is far from God, who needs desperately to come home. Who is that one life who desperately needs to come back home? And the reality is, you want to know what the surprise is? We think the story is about God searching out after, after us, and part of it is. But guess what? Shepherds are hired. Shepherds are hired. And you have been employed by the Father who owns those sheep to be that shepherd, to depart from your life and go after it, even if it's just one. Just one lost sheep who tenderly needs to come home, not scolded, not beaten, but brought home. What matters to Jesus, I pray, matters to us. There are people in our lives that are lost in addiction. They're lost in insecurity. They're lost in selfishness. They think life is about them, and I know that They'll never attain God's purpose for their life as long as they keep seeking out their own pleasure. They're lost. But they, but they can be found. They can be found. There's hope. They can be found. <laughs> I'll see that on YouTube. So, the lost can be found and brought home, but there's a big if to that statement, if you search for them. The lost can be found and brought home if you search for him or her. Remember this, if you don't get anything out of today, I want you to know one thing. I want you to get this. If you don't hear anything tonight, I want you to hear one thing. Your friends will say yes to you before they say yes to Jesus. Your friends will say yes to you before they say yes to Jesus. The lost can be found and be brought home. That's if you search for them, if you pursue them, if you're willing to depart from your life and go after that lost sheep, if you're willing to search with an undetermined time, you're just going to go for it. And what I want you to do is a couple things. If you're ready for action, you're willing to do something about this, you're willing to call, if you're willing to make what's important to God important to you and do something about it today, there's a few things I want you to do. The first thing I want you to do is identify the lost person in your life, person who's far. And maybe that's you. Maybe you're watching on YouTube and you just kind of stumbled in. Great. Maybe that's you. And I want you to know God is pursuing you relentlessly. And he's a gentleman. See, unlike the coin and unlike the sheep, they didn't have a choice, but you do. You have a choice to be rescued. God's not going to violate your free will. You have a choice to be rescued. And unlike the motivation of the shepherd and the widow who was motivated by shame and guilt and dishonor, God is motivated by his love for you. I want you to know that 
your friends will say yes to you before they say yes to Jesus. So please get on board if you want to be a Jesus follower, if you already are a Jesus follower, if you think that you're close to God, or, or even if you think that you're far from God, you can get on board right now. Because what I want you to know is this, that, that God can care a whole lot less about where you've been and a whole lot more about where you are right now. Amen. True. Come on. And amens are all good, you know. Keep it coming. All right. The second thing I want you to do is prayerfully pursue them. Prayerfully pursue them. And so, of course, we have these hoedown cards. And I want you to know that this hoedown is a party with a purpose. All right? I'm not here to throw a party for a bunch of Christian kids, right? The last thing I want is passionate Christ consumers, right? I'm not trying to sell you anything. I don't want... In fact, you're not even invited to this party, right? (laughs) You aren't, right? Because... This is your party to invite people to, right? This is your party to invite people who would not even step foot on a church campus if it wasn't for 20 baby pigs and a little horse named Little Sebastian, right? Like this, this is your party. So I want you to take this flyer, we'll take multiple flyers, and put one in a place where you can prayerfully consider who this belongs to. It first starts with identifying who that person is, who that one life is. And then secondly, before you even say anything to them, you are praying relentlessly for them. Because the search happens spiritually before it happens physically. Because God is the one who gives you the courage. God is the one who prepares the heart. You may not know what God is doing in that person's heart. And some of you have already written off some of these people. And you're like, oh, you know, that person never going to come to God. Right? You, you can't write these people off. God has not. He's relentlessly pursuing the people in your life. And he invites you to be a part of that. And the next thing I want you to do is Invite people to to Jesus. And one of the ways you do that is celebrating. Celebrating with them. When the lost come home, and hopefully they would show up on September 10th. And we can celebrate together. Because the week after that, we will have a very special service. Because the third story in Luke 15 You may have read ahead. I know you guys, you're smart. You look ahead. Anytime someone gives you a packet, you're like, I'm already at the back. Because the next story that Jesus tells is about the prodigal son. Because you have a lost coin, you have a lost sheep, but most important, we have a lost son. And my heart is to share the gospel relentlessly, courageously, through you, to you, and that we would celebrate together at the Ridge, September 17th. So, will you take the challenge? Will you pray? Will you, will you first, inv- will you first um, sorry, will you first picture that one? Will you first picture the person in your mind? And then will you pray for them? And then will you pursue them? Will you picture, picture them in your mind, pray for them, and pursue them? And, and you know what? You know when, when it's the right time to invite them? I, I, like, I love this one. This part's awesome. You, you want to know when the right time is to invite them? Is when you hear the three knots. The three knots. The first knot is, I'm not from around here. Oh, really? Well, you should come with me and my church family. They're awesome. And Soma, like, you got to meet, like, Samantha. She's an awesome singer. Whoa. <laughs> so good. Okay, that's the first knot. <laughs> the second knot is, I do not have a lot of friends. Well, awesome. Come meet my church family. <laughs> They're so friendly. And the third knot is, I'm not religious. Oh, great, because we're not religious either. Because we believe that Jesus invites us into a relationship, not a religion. So those are opportunities for you to invite them, but it starts prayer. It starts prayerfully. 
I hope that you're burdened by the things that burden God's heart. My heart is that you would not become consumers of Christianity just looking for the best band, looking for the best pastor or preacher, because there's a lot of them out there. My prayer is that you just be looking for the best opportunity to share the best thing that you have, which is eternal life, to people who are far from God. I mean, imagine what, what it would look like if we just became that type of culture, that if everyone in this room pursued one, that one life, just prayerfully pursued one life, that one lost person, and invited them to come back home, what would that look like? What would that look like if this whole church did that? Like Rocky Peak in general, like, like Rocky Peak, we were just committed to pursuing the one life That wouldn't be bad. I'm going to invite the band up. And I just want you to consider what it would look like for you in your life. To seek after that lost coin and to seek after that lost sheep. So who is it in your life that you can't imagine heaven without? And let me just tell you, it starts with a prayer and it starts with an invitation. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word that does not return void. Thank you that these are not just stories that are made up, but these are stories that tell us really what's interesting to you, what you love most. And instead of praying that, that you would bless me or answer my prayers, my prayer right now is that you would help me to love the things that you love. That you would change my desires to love the things that you love. That what's important to you would be important to me every single day for the rest of my life. That the idea... of the one lost life. Not spending eternity with me would break my heart and would, and would cause me to action, would give me a vision to search relentlessly and lovingly until they come home to you. In Jesus' name, we all said, amen.